Hey everybody, you are about to watch an amazing episode of Impact Theory with David Goggins. I love this episode more than I can tell you. I absolutely am blown away by David Goggins himself, but I wanna give a full disclaimer. First of all, this man swears a lot, and when I say that, you know it's an issue. So if you have kids around you, now would be the time to get them out. Also, his worldview is ultra hardcore. I'm not recommending that everybody uh, do what he does, which is pretty extreme, um, but I just wanted to give everybody a full warning ahead of time, but I think this man is incredible. But let it be said, you have been warned. And now, welcome to Impact Theory with David Goggins. Everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. You are here, my friends, because you believe that human potential is nearly limitless, but you know that having potential is not the same as actually doing something with it. So our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that will help you actually execute on your dreams. All right, today's guest is widely considered to be the toughest man on the planet and one of the greatest endurance athletes of all time. But if you're tempted to dismiss him as the product of amazing genetics, great parenting, or even performance enhancing drugs, think again. He grew up in an abusive household, spent his high school years as one of only a small number of black kids in a tiny Indiana town, roughly 20 miles from where the KKK was founded, he had to endure relentless bullying, and he barely managed to graduate with a 1.6 GPA. He struggled with obesity twice in his life, weighing in at over 300 pounds, had severe allergies, sickle cell trait, and a congenital heart disease that left him with a hole in his heart the size of a poker chip. He grew up feeling soft and weak with no self-esteem, but despite all of that, one day he decided he was going to stop saying woe is me and start kicking some ass. That set him on a path to transforming himself into the hardest man alive. Did he do it? Well, he's the only member of the US Armed Forces to complete SEAL training, the US Army Ranger School, and the Air Force Tactical Air Controller Training. He's completed the infamous Destroyer of Men known as Hell Week three times, including two in a single year, and one that he started and finished with multiple stress fractures and a hernia. He served in combat in Iraq, was the bodyguard for the Iraqi Prime Minister. He once held the Guinness World Record for most pull-ups in 24 hours at 4,030. He's run eight, eight consecutive 100-mile races over eight back-to-back -back weekends. He ran over 7,000 miles in a single year, and that is the equivalent of running 267 marathons. I think it is abundantly clear that this man is a self-made beast. So please, help me in welcoming the man who once ran an ultra marathon with pneumonia, the king of no excuses, David Goggins. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, I assure you. The things that you've done are absolutely incredible, but what I find fascinating is if you just read your litany of things that you've accomplished, you do just assume, oh, you must be really gifted. You're shredded, you're in great shape, but when you see the before picture, it's pretty startling. Right. So what was that moment like, looking in the mirror the day you decide, okay, wait, enough is enough? Well, it was pretty crazy for me. It, um, it, it took a while to get to that point where enough was enough. Um, what happened, uh, I, I came home one night from work spraying for cockroaches and um, long story short, I turned on the, the um, Discovery Channel and I saw some guys going through Navy SEAL training and they were going through Hell Week and they were getting their ass just beat, you know, in and out of the water, guys ringing the bell, um, they were just suffering and I was weighing like 297 pounds and I had to make a change in my life. You know, I was at an all-time low, and I wasn't going anywhere, and I was exactly what everybody said I was going to be, which was nothing. So I had to make a change. What was it about seeing suffering? That's, that's really interesting, and I actually get it, but I want to hear you explain it. Why suffering was the thing that triggered that thought? Well, for me, growing up, I came from a horrible background. I got called nigger every day of my life growing up, um, lived in a small town. The Klan headquarters at that time was about... Um, 20 minutes from where I lived. 
right. the uh, one of the high ups in the KKK son sat behind me in two classes. So he called me nigger all the time. I got my first car. They spray printed nigger. We're going to kill you on it. So I was just an insecure, scared kid. And the only way I could find myself was through putting myself through the worst thing possible. Yeah. How'd you have the insight though? Like that's so counterintuitive. Like most people, that's precisely what they're trying to get away from. Right. So what was it in you at that moment? You're overweight. You've been bullied essentially your entire life up to that point. What makes you go, all right, motherfucker, like that, that's what I've got to do. Well, no one was helping me out. So my mom, my dad made my mom kind of irregular. So she worked three jobs, went to college full time. So she was never around. One time this, this person drew a picture of me and you know, said, we're gonna kill you nigger on my Spanish notebook. Jesus. And I took it to my principal. And my principal said, they spelled nigger Niger. That was the best advice he can give me. So long story short, what I realized was no one was here to help me. Mm. And the feeling I had every morning, I started shaving my head when I was 16 years old. And the feeling I had every morning when I looked in the mirror was horrible. And I didn't wanna feel like that anymore. And how I felt was a, a kid going nowhere, a kid that was scared. And most kids will accept that and look for help. But the best thing that happened to me, no one helped me. No one felt sorry for me. Mm. No one looked at me and said, like this day and age, they'll, they'll take you in and they'll tell everybody, stop picking on this person. Back then, they didn't care. The KKK marched in our 4th of July parades. <laughs> they had to stay 100 yards back, but they marched in it. Wow. That's how this town was. And my mom cared about me, but my dad took our soul. Mm. And she you know, did the best she could. I had to figure out I wasn't going to be a punk kid all my life. So the only way I could turn it around was to suffer. I had to build calluses in my brain the same way I built calluses on my hands. So I broke the Ginsburg Royals record for pull-ups a long time ago, but I failed at it twice. And I did 67,000 pull-ups in trying to break this record. So to do 4,030 pull-ups, I had to do 67,000 for training for that. Wow. And so what I realized is for me to become the man I wanted to become, I saw myself as the weakest person God ever created. But I never blamed God for anything he did to me. So I wanted to change that to be the hardest man ever created. Am I that? I don't know, but you had to have a goal. Right. And my goal when I was sitting there, not going to school, being bullied, being, having no self-esteem, my goal was the only person that's going to turn this person around is me. And the only way I can turn it around is put myself through the worst things possible a human being can ever endure. And that would be the only way that I can build this brain to handle anything that comes in front of it, callousing my mind right. through pain and suffering. That's so powerful. It's such an amazing insight. So obviously listening to some of the stuff that you're talking about and one thing that you say often is, you know, it's, it's hard to stay hard or get hard when you're living in, you know, like you even said at one point in a big mansion in Beverly Hills, right? So I was sitting there thinking, you're absolutely right. But what I find so interesting is how we as a species, run from pain, we run from suffering. And one of the reasons, I've talked about this before, but one of the reasons my wife and I don't have kids is I firmly believe that you need something that is brutal, is difficult, is hardship, it knocks you off center, it makes you feel bad, because in the process of rebuilding and clawing back from that, climbing up, then you can become something. But you, unless you've been tested, unless you've gone through the ringer, you've got no hope. So how do you take somebody that you love and force them through that? And I think that what you've done is maybe the ultimate expression of that, which is how do you put yourself through it? Right? You don't have to do any of that. So in the end, like, what would your advice be to that 16-year-old kid who's staring in the mirror does not like what he sees, but is still running from adversity? Well, my biggest advice to him is that, first of all, he won't like what I say to him. Because I'm going to say the exact opposite of what the world, today's world, is saying. So we read a bunch of books nowadays. Mm -hmm. as, as humans, we, we want to find out how to be someone else. What we don't do is we don't go inside. So literally turn yourself inside out. Read the book that says, like, like we're writing a book every day of our lives. But we never read that book. So what I would challenge this young man or, or, or young woman to do 
is you have to look inside of yourself to see what you really want. What, what are you passionate about? We use these words and these little phrases of only the strong survive and all this other crap. They're all just fucking words. I get so tired of hearing people just talking. Like right now, someone may think Goggins is just talking. <laughs> you don't know me. So when I speak, I speak from passion. I speak from experience. I, I, I speak from suffering. I have to tell this young man or woman that the only way I believe, and this is just my experience in life, the only way you're ever going to get to the other side of this journey is you have got to suffer, to grow. To grow, you must suffer. And some people will get it and some people won't. But they have to see what their journey is to start their journey. Several people live to be 100 years old and they have great lives and they have great kids. Their kids go to college and all sorts of stuff. But somewhere in their life, there was a point where they had a decision to make. They can go left or right on this path. Left was the easy route. Right was the hard route. A lot of people take the easy route. And they had a good life that way, but the better life was going to the right side. And you may have 20 years of pain and suffering to get past it, but a lot of us die never truly starting our journey. And I would tell this young person, you got to start your journey. It may suck, but it will. It will come out the other side where you're coasting.